a very interesting aspect of Western civilization, one that is not as explicitly remarked upon, I think, as it should be, though implicitly it's embedded in a great deal of scholarship and commentary and certainly in the contemporary world around us. And that's the, the cult of the body. Um, if you look at civilizations around the world, they have very different attitudes toward the body. Obviously, everybody has a body. But whether or not uh, one is preoccupied with its physicality, whether or not one idealizes it uh, as something to be aspired to, that perfect shape, uh, varies a great deal. Um, some civilizations uh, are very covered up enterprises, um, and others look at the body, but they look at the body in a variety of different ways. Uh, in, in Western civilization, not only in ancient Greece, but I think because of ancient Greece, throughout the rest of classical antiquity, then on with perhaps a dry patch during parts of the Middle Ages uh, into the Renaissance, early modern life, and certainly contemporary culture. Uh, the West's preoccupation with things bodily and the beauty of the body and the cult of the body and developing the body has been really uh, unsurpassed, unsurpassed in popular culture and high culture, uh, in literature, in art, uh, in just about every way you can imagine. And like so much that is exceptionally Western, uh, we can trace this back to our friends, as I mentioned, the ancient Greeks. So we have an expert on this subject here today, Professor Charles Stocking of the University of Western Ontario's Classical Studies Department, Classical Studies Department uh, has been thinking deeply about a great many things having to do with antiquity, but very especially about antiquity and our preoccupation with the body and our effort to perfect it. Um, we've had some interesting lunch conversations before getting here, so I know that what you're going to hear is going to be <coughs> truly interesting and mind-expanding. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the embodiment of the cult of the body as understood in scholarship, <laughs> Charles Stockton. Thanks so much, Steve, for uh, a nice introduction. And I'd also like to thank you and uh, thank David Bonner uh, and Peter Miller and everybody in the Classical Studies Department for a really wonderful time here in this great series of events that's uh, being organized this week. So I wanted to sort of start with this idea, it's something that Steve mentioned, which is the embeddedness <coughs> of the value that we place on the body today. And I think perhaps in the history of sort of uh, Western history, we can think about modern physical culture as really at a place that is unparalleled in the history of the world, perhaps only comparable to the ancient Greek situation. The degree to which people are in invested in, the tra in physical training and the appearance of the body is really uh, unprecedented, I think. And one of the questions is why and how do we get to this point? Um, and really, Greece is ever present in this uh, story and this value that we have. And part of the project today, or part of the presentation, is really going to be to disembed this value and try to sort of uh, analyze it and think about it in relationship to the ancient Greek past and how and why it is uh, that there is this connection that's sort of ever present with the ancient Greeks, as from many of the images here. I think there is, in fact, it's sort of the 20th century is really a, what we might consider a tipping point in the history of this relationship between the ancient Greek body and our own modern bodies. And really a large part of this is, in, is perhaps due to uh, the Olympic movement and Pierre de Coubertin in particular. Pierre de Coubertin is the self-proclaimed uh, founder and patriarch of the modern Olympic movement. And for him, there's this notion that athletics itself, at least in the ancient world, was understood primarily in terms of its religious function, and this is absolutely true, but for Coubertin, he saw this also as a way in which to reinvigorate a modern, what he called religio athletae, a religion of the athlete and also a sort of worship of athletes. So there's this question on the genitive, is it subjective or objective, right? <coughs> is this 
the worship of athletes or is this the religion of them? But Kubrick states here, and it's very clear his purpose, he says the primary fundamental characteristic of ancient Olympism and of modern Olympism as well is that it is a religion. By chiseling his body through exercise as a sculptor does a statue, the ancient athlete honored the gods. In doing likewise, the modern athlete honors his country, his race, and his flag. So there's a lot of interesting things to think about with regard to this. But more specifically, I want to focus, really use this as a starting point for this investigation on two points. One, to what extent is Coubertin correct in his characterization of this form of religious worship and the idea of sculpting the body in honor of the gods? And second, to what extent uh, does this actually translate into a modern cult of the body? Is there, in fact, what we would consider a re almost religious form of worship of the body and athletics in the modern era? Now, to begin with, then, we have to sort of go back to the ancient world. And here I want to focus first on Coubertin's metaphor. Uh, here he specifically says, uh, by chiseling his body through exercise as a sculptor does a statue. In part, Coubertin is correct in focusing on the role of sculpture itself. And of course, this is related to a fundamental problem when we think about the ancient Greek body. The fact is that we don't have them. What we have are the representations of bodies, primarily in painting and sculpture. And this, of course, also gets to a major religious point about ancient Greek society, namely the sort of fundamental anthropomorphic nature of Greek society. And I was extremely pleased, having come to the campus and found the Artemisian bronze in front of the library, right? So a sort of very nice surprise was not planned. I had this on the, on the PowerPoint before I got here. But there's this fundamental connection in Greek religion between athletics and the so-called anthropomorphism of the gods, the body of the gods. And of course, the Artemisian bronze is a perfect example of this. Uh, at the same time, <coughs> there's this uh, question, right? Of course, in this case, there's that question of the identity of the Artemisian bronze. Uh, is it Zeus or Poseidon? But were it not for the beard, there's another question. Is this a man or is this a god? There's this fundamental question. And if it's a god, you know, it's a good looking one. If it's a man, he's been putting in some time at the gym. <laughs> and we also have this other question here, and it shows up again in a not so famous sculpture, this so-called uh, Omphalos Apollo here, presented from the British Museum just around the corner behind the Parthenon frieze. But it has a famous plaque which I absolutely love, it simply states, God or athlete. And, and on top of that, it's also a Roman copy of a Greek original, perhaps from the uh, 460s, the original, but the Roman copy is first century AD. So what we have in this is a real problem of representation and identification. What is the referent of the statue? On the one hand, because we, you know, it's missing the arms, which might have held a bow or some other aspects that could help us to identify this figure, what we're missing, essentially, are any characteristics to know this. But what this gets to at the heart of is this ambiguous relationship between the athletic body and the body of a god. And this, again, is this fundamental principle of anthropomorphism, i.e. gods in the shapes of humans. But uh, the famous French classicist Jean-Pierre Vernant actually wants to reverse this in order to get behind the mindset of an ancient Greek. So when asking about anthropomorphic gods, he says perhaps this equation should be reversed and we should think more appropriately of theomorphic humans. That is, humans in the shapes of gods, if only for a brief moment. And he says, in all its active aspects, in all the components of its physical and psychological dynamism, the human body reflects the divine model as the inexhaustible source of vital energy when, for an instance, the brilliance of divinity happens to fall on a mortal creature, illuminating him as in a fleeting glow with a little of that splendor that always clothes the body of a god. So we have in this also a temporal component, a brief moment of splendor as opposed to the permanent state of a god. What is that brief moment? That brief moment could be in battle. It could also, most importantly, be the moment of victory. But what we have, though, is this sort of deferral of the actual body and a reference to a divine body which is never necessarily physically present except in its representations. So there's a fundamental ambiguity between gods and humans in the conceptualization of the body. But what's also interesting about this is the fact that this ambiguity is also reflected in the history of the representation of both ancient uh, athletic bodies as well as uh, divine figures. And so I just want to present a few examples of this thinking about Coubertin's model. The first and most famous 
uh, is probably the magic fossil problem. This is one of our earliest uh, representations in the historical period of uh, representing the body. It's, a, it's about this big. Uh, and the inscription here is also very important. And it sort of gets us into a very unique relationship on how humans conceptualize their relationship with the gods and how this is also mediated through the body itself. The inscription says, and this is inscribed on the side of the leg, Manticlos has dedicated me to him who strikes from afar with the silver bow, that's Apollo, of his first fruits, give a pleasing response. So this is very interesting for a couple of reasons. First, this notion of the pleasing response. <coughs> what uh, what Manticlos, this person who has dedicated this uh, figure, is trying to do is invoke or in involve the god in a process of reciprocity the principle of giving in exchange. So he's giving this gift, and he wants his prayers answered uh, by Apollo. But what's also fascinating about this uh, image is the image itself. The image speaks, right? Because what does it say? It says, Manticlos has dedicated me. The object itself, this representation of a body, one of our earliest figural representations, and eventually they become monumental. The image speaks, and it's neither Manticlos nor Apollo. It is something separate as an object that in some sense mediates between humans and gods in the cycle of reciprocity. So there's a way in which the representation of the body itself acts as a form of mediation between gods and humans, between mortal and immortal. Now as this uh, development occurs in the history of representations, we soon get uh, larger, more lifelike and monumental sculptures, and this is most famously seen in the history of the Kuros. Uh, and again, the ambiguity here is extremely important. I've provided just a few famous examples. I've provided the Egyptian uh, example here because this is probably one of the sources for understanding the development of the Koros, at least historically in terms of its positioning. Of course, with one small uh, minor detail, you know, missing the loincloth, so we have a fully nude uh, figure in the Greek examples. But uh, what's also important here is the Koros Again, it's a representation. What it refers to is ambiguous. It's a funerary marker, often, used uh, specifically at, for the death of warriors, athletes, and other figures. And uh, the Chrysos Koros represented here is most famous for that. There's an inscription that goes along with it, which says, stop and show pity beside the marker of Chrysos, dead whom once in battle's front rank, raging air is destroyed. Now, but again, here we have this problem of reference. The image itself says, or you know, the inscription says, show pity beside the marker of, of Chrysos, the same on. So it's not as though, now the question is, is this image, is this what Chrysos looked like? Not necessarily, because we have a certain degree of uniformity in the representation of the Kuros. This isn't necessarily a representation of Chrysos per se, nor is it necessarily a representation of the god. So there's this question of what exactly does it represent? It represents perhaps some idealized form of a body, and in this case with the Chrysos inscription, uh, the very fact that someone can afford this type of marker shows that they belong to a certain aristocratic level, and so it could show a sort of idealization and elitism on that in that respect. But as, as time progresses, we do find, in fact, the identification of a similar representation with the god, and most famously this appears with the Piraeus Apollo, and here again we see almost an exact same representation as the Quarles, except with one fundamental difference, he has the handout, right? And again, this handout is a reflection of the engagement with humans in the cycle of reciprocity. We have many inscriptions that talk about dedicating things into the hands of the God. So again, we see this interesting representation that one of our idealizations of the body is A, a marker of their mortality, a funerary marker, and at the same time can also be used as a representation of the god. So we have this interesting conflict between mortal and immortal and a certain degree of ambiguity in this representation. And again, Renat wants to see this as fundamentally connected. Uh, and he says, the size, smile, and beauty of corporeal forms of the Kuros, along with the movement uh, their bodies suggest, express these powers of life, a life always present, always vivid. The image of the gods fixed by the anthropomorphic statue is that of the immortals, the happy ones, the ever young, those who in the purity of their existence are utterly alien to decline, corruption, and death. So for Renaud, he is asking why is it that the images of the god are so similar to the representations in funerary markers? 
Well, that moment of death represents a moment of supreme beauty and also immortality. This, the one moment when a human is like a god. So on a representational level, we see this connection between the physical beauty of a body and the, and the sort of idealization of the ancient Greek gods as a projection. How, of course, does this relate to athletic practice? And here again, the cycle of reciprocity is very important. As I mentioned, there's this notion of the divine moment, the moment of victory, for instance, in athletics. And we see this also through various uh, representations and inscriptions related to athletic practice. Now, of course, many of our actual statues that would have been dedicated to the gods in the context of athletic victories are absent, but we do have some inscriptions. And most famously, we have the so-called Cleombrotos inscription. This is one of our earliest inscriptions from Olympia. And the inscription is very interesting for several reasons. First, because it is a dedication. It's understood as a gift, invoking the cycle of reciprocity. But it also gets into an issue of the presence of the god in the practice of athletics, as well as the representation of the athlete himself. So here we have the inscription. It says, Cleombrotos, son of Dexilaos, having won at Olympia, dedicated, and this last bit is blank. What exactly is it? Is it it? Is it me? Is the statue speaking? But most importantly, it says, equal to him in height and width, a prize as a, as a tenth uh, prayer, praying to Athena. So there's this very interesting uh, aspect. And I want to focus here on this notion of equal to him in height and width. There's an idea here that the statue itself is supposed to exactly represent the person, right, as a replacement for the athletic victor who has in some sense risked or endangered their life in athletic competition. So what we have then is a dedication of the statue in place as a sort of ritual substitute for the athlete himself. And again, also with the presence that this is not possible without the existence and participation of the gods in this athletic moment, praying to Athena. And so with, with the cycle of reciprocity and the idea of the body itself and its representation as the object in this exchange mode, we have other inscriptions, and I just want to provide one more for you. And this is another uh, victory inscription, uh, which says, standing upon the Alpheus, the Pelasgian boxer, once demonstrated with his hands, the nomos, the sort of custom or habits of Polydeuces, when he was heralded as victor. But Father Zeus again granted and returned Pleos to Arcadia and honor Philippus, who here leaned on four boys with straight fighting. So again, there's this interesting idea of a cycle of reciprocity, uh, where he asks, uh, the, the inscription asks, Father Zeus grant in return pleos, so the idea of reputation, what is it that is going to be gotten in exchange for the dedication of the statue itself, is the reputation of the athlete, but not just the athlete, also the city-state to which he belongs. So there's an invoking, an invoking of the sort of civic ideology along with an aristocratic ideology. So with this, though, we see that the body itself is this thing that is exchanged. But of course, it's not the body, it's the representation, and this is what I want to focus on this problem, right? And this problem specifically of you know, the absence of the physical body in place of the body uh, itself or the representation. And how Kubertan frames this? Because I want to return to this point that he says, by chiseling his body through exercise as a sculptor does a statue, the ancient athlete honored the gods. So in some sense, Kubertan is correct, right? The ath athletes did honor the gods. But they did not necessarily, as far as we can see, did not honor it specifically through their own physical bodies. Perhaps <coughs> athletics was understood that way. But what they honored them through was actual sculpture. Right? So in some sense, Kubertan has sort of inverted the simile here. An athlete honored the gods through sculpture. What Kubertan suggests is that the athlete chiseled his own body as though a sculpture. And so this notion of the chiseled body, this is what I want to focus on. This is a common metaphor today. Right? We think of the sculpted body. There are even classes at Gold's Gym called body sculpted. Right? This is a dead metaphor, the sculptural metaphor. But Kubertan's own notion of this really presents a mimetic reversal. What is it that happens here in Kubertan's suggestion? The athlete himself becomes a sculpture, right? as opposed to sculpture being a replacement for the athlete. So some of the questions to think about here is whether or not uh, this, in fact, has any historical basis. Is his idea of this mimetic reversal, is it a modern construct? Is this, is this a function of our own reception of the ancient tra tradition? Or does it, in fact, have a basis in the ancient athletic tradition? And here, I'm going to sort of argue for three points about this. 
One, I want to say that Coubertin's Olympism, his philosophy about the Olympic movement, and this argument for what we would call a mimetic reversal, where the body itself becomes a representation as opposed to the actual thing, this is actually based on ancient aesthetics theory of sculpture. So there's a way in which Coubertin is engaging with the ancient, uh, with ancient aesthetic theory and not just with ancient athletics. Two, this argument for mimetic reversal is also a function of a very long historical discourse <laughs> on Greek sculpture and the modern body in modernity. And I think this goes back at least to Winkelmann. And so we're going to see in which the ways in which Coubertin is not simply constructing a modern ideology, but he's really participating in a long history that comes to define the body in modernity. And lastly, and this is perhaps the most striking aspect, this historical discourse of mimetic reversal, we do in fact have evidence for this in antiquity itself. The idea of the sculpted body is not just a modern <coughs> construct, but is present in antiquity, especially in the Roman Imperial period. So these are the sort of three aspects of the talk that I'm going to be covering today with reference to the ancient athletic tradition. So to begin with, uh, let's think first about Coubertin's notion of and philosophy of Olympism. He's invoking the ancient Greek past, but again, he does so in very specific terms. And here is just one account of the copious writings he has on this notion of Olympism. He says, it was Hellenism's immortal glory to have conceived of the codification of the pursuit of balance and to make of it a formula for social greatness. Here in Olympia, we stand on the ruins of the first capital of the kingdom of Eurythmy. Now, this is a very strange word, right? This term Eurythmy itself, it's not something that we are necessarily familiar with. But it is the term that Coubertin really wants to focus on. And this does, in fact, have a long tradition in ancient aesthetic theory. He specifies this term in another, uh, in another uh, section of his discussion on the relationship between the Greek past and the present. And here he also gives another motivation for why it is that he wants to invoke Greek in the first place. He says, proper proportion is the sister of order. They are siblings intended to grow up together. I use the term proportion. But if that is not the word I want. The term that springs to mind is eurythmia. In this regard, however, we, the French and the Germans, do not see eye to eye very well. The Germans believe that the concept of rhythm predominates in the Greek term. In French, we focus more attention on the first syllable. It evokes the idea of the beautiful, the perfect. Everything that is properly proportioned is eurythmic. It was Hellenism, above all else, that advocated measure and proper proportion, co-creators of beauty, grace, and strength, we must return to these Greek concepts to offset the appalling ugliness of the industrial age through which we have just lived. So there's this way in which uh, there's this way in which the Olympic movement is understood as an aesthetic movement and in response to industrialism. But with this, we also see in this a sort of national uh, a nationalistic claim against the Germans, and specifically this notion of rhythm here. And there's this question specifically on the the very idea of eurythmia. Of course, we would think it has to do with rhythm, with movement, and whether it is it has a presentational significance or a sort of uh, temporal significance. And of course, there was uh, a movement known as Eurythmy, part of the sort of Waldorf school, and this is perhaps also related to the uh, German athletic movement known as Tornen, which is responsible for militarization at the turn of the century. And this is perhaps what Coubertin is referring to. But this other aspect, the idea of eurythmia as a presentational significance, this probably has a basis in ancient aesthetic theory, most likely with the, uh, with the work of Vitruvius uh, from the first century. Who, and Vitruvius wrote De Architectura, a text on architecture. But here is perhaps the locus classicus for this definition. He says, eurythmia is a beautiful appearance and a fitting aspect of the parts in composition. This is achieved when the parts of a work have a height suitable to their width, a width suitable to their length, in short, when all aspects respond to each other uh, proportionally. At sumum omnia respondent sua symmetria. So in, in, involved in this notion are parts and their relationship to each other in an aesthetic composition. And Vitruvius goes on and he specifically defines this further in relationship to the human body. He says, just as in the human body, the quality of eurythmia is proportionality, and it's it, the term there is symmetros, from the forearm, the palm, the finger, and from other small details. So too is their eurythmia in the finished details of a building. So Vitruvius' own analogy of eurythmia, which is 
you know, which is architectural, is actually based on analogy with the human body. Now, of course, Leonardo da Vinci tries to demonstrate this with the famous Vitruvian man, but uh, Vitruvius himself was most, not, was most likely not using the human body per se in his own account. Rather, his theories of eurythmia and by extension symmetria are most likely based on the classical uh, sculptor Polyclitus and his own theory of the symmetry of the body. And this is most famously represented in the Deriferous uh, sculptor, and here we have the Roman copy of that. Now again, as far as how do we actually understand Polyclitus' own theory of symmetria, here is where art historians have had to excavate numerous texts in reconstructing this actual theory. And Galen is in fact the, uh, the medical physician, is perhaps one of our best sources for Polyclitus symmetria, and I'll talk about why it is that Galen would be such an important source for this uh, later on in the talk. But for the purposes of uh, our immediate purposes, I just want to focus on his actual definition. Here he's talking about uh, the history of philosophy, and he says, he, Chrysippus, thinks that beauty lies not in the proportion of elements, but in the proportion of the parts of the body. A finger, obviously, to finger, of all the fingers to palm and wrist, of these to the forearm, of forearm to upper arm, and of all to all, as it has been written in the canon of Polyclitus. And so there's this famous canon of Polyclitus, and this, there's a question, you know, what is the canon? Can we find it? Is the Deriferous an example of the canon? And people have done numerous measurements, gotten out their, you know, their rulers to, to figure out this exact proportionality of the Deriferous, and can they reconstruct this idea of perfect measurements? Now, all of this is well and good, and it's very interesting, but what it also shows, perhaps, is that Polyclitus himself is considered, at least in the history of art, as somebody who dramatically departs from the idea of imitation proper, the idea of the copy of something that exists in real life, and instead deriving proportions from a mathematical equation. And this mathematical equation is also perhaps based on philosophical concepts of perfection and uh, Pythagorean concepts in particular. So here we have a couple different uh, pieces of textual evidence that have a very similar uh, terminology that is associated with Polyclitus. So again, here talking about um, uh, this notion of perfection at the top from Philo Mechanicus, there's a quote, so that the phrase spoken by the sculptor Polyclitus is appropriate for the one about to speak. Uh, perfection, he said, comes about paramicron through many numbers. So there's an idea of measurement and mathematical equation in this, as opposed to just a sort of copy. And then secondly, uh, Diogenes Laertius talking about Socrates and Zeno, says he used to say that perfection comes about paramicron, but that is by no means small. Others say that Socrates said this too. And then finally, we have uh, Aristotle's metaphysics that says perfection is from the numbers, esti apoto arithmo. And so we have this idea of perfection of to'u that is somehow perhaps based on a mathematical equation. And perhaps this mathematical equation then also then informs sculpture. If there's this proliferation of images of these sculptures of beautiful bodies, and yet there's a complete acknowledgement that these sculptures do not, in fact, reflect reality. This creates a sort of mimetic paradox for us, and one which uh, art historians have also discussed, most famously uh, Nigel Spivey, referring to this as a concept known as body fascism. And again, he, he explains body fascism as follows. He says, in the cities and sanctuaries that the Greeks frequented, there was by the mid-fifth century a standing population, as it were, of male nude statues the classical male nude was almost oppressively exemplary. So that, I think, is an important term, oppressively exemplary. The idea of an exemplum, but one that causes you know, a certain degree of discomfort and pain. He says, in modern parlance, this amounts to body fascism. The imposition of norms for acceptable or successful bodies brought about by a great commercial exposure to paragons of ideal proportions. So in other words, we have a disconnect between the representation of the body and actual physical bodies. And for Spivey, he wants to see this as somehow creating a sort of psychological problem for the Greeks in this pressure to imitate something that everybody knows cannot be imitated. Now, within uh, art history, there's, there are, of course, a lot of arguments against Spivey's notion of body fascism, specifically by Robert Osborne, thinking that this itself is just a modern construct. And the, the very fact of the cult of the body beautiful is, in fact, something that was not necessarily present because of its relationship to the, to the divine as something that is not necessarily human. And for the moment, I want to leave aside that question of the accuracy of body fascism in antiquity and think about the reception 
of sculpture, ancient sculpture in modernity. So perhaps Polyclitus does not necessarily reflect ancient body fascism, but it could we could say that he does that Polyclitus was used for modern body fascism. So again, if we think about Kubrick's statement, his statements on Eurythmia are in fact written, and again, this is important for historical context. These were written in an in a, uh, article titled The Origins and Limits of Athletic Progress in the German newspaper BZ am Mittag. And this really is in response to this question of what it means for a handsome athletic race to flourish. Right? So this is right before the 1936 Berlin Olympics, the most controversial of the Olympic Games. And here he's talking about this notion of the beauty of sculpture. And he says, I said just that uh, in order for a handsome athletic race to flourish, an atmosphere of calm and proportion had to be prepared for it. Proper proportion is the sister of order. I use the term proportion, but that, not, that is not the word I want. The word I want is eurythmia. Now, of course, this balance of this mimetic reversal, if we're thinking about the Berlin Olympics, is most famously represented in uh, the documentary of Leonard Riefenstahl, Olympia, where the German decathlete, or where uh, Myron's Discobolus is transformed before the viewer's eyes into the German decathlete, Erwin Kuber. So here we see that absolute representation of the, the conversion from sculpture into the living body, right? Perhaps it was an impossible ideal that could not be realized in the ancient Greek times, but at least according to Riefenstahl, it can be realized in Nazi Germany. Now, this of course presents an interesting point with regard to <coughs> Kuber Ten himself, who was simultane simultaneously trying to distance himself from the German tradition, and yet this very notion of reinvoking the concept of eurythmia and making athletes, as it were, living sculpture is very much a part of this ancient concept of body fascism. Now, in the second part of uh, this talk, what I want to do is actually demonstrate how Kubertin's own arguments can, in fact, be uh, rooted or traced back to a sort of German idealist tradition, going back to Johann Joachim Winkelmann, where this notion of the imitation of sculpture is perhaps rooted. Uh, and here, of course, uh, there's a, an important concept uh, introduced by uh, James Porter that I think is very important, the notion of bodybuilding, right? So not bodybuilding, but something different, where the body itself, through an appeal to uh, art, it, as the body as an imitation of art, becomes an object of aesthetic reflection in and of itself, by way of its relationship. Now, of course, Winkelmann said in his first work, Imitations of Greek Works in 1755, there is but one way for us moderns to become great and for the ancients. So again, the paradox there is uh, absolutely present. And Winkelmann is most famous for establishing the so-called Greek ideal in uh, the intellectual history of modernity. And again, uh, Winkelmann, like the Kubertin, wants to invoke the ancient Greek past as somehow superior to the present. He says the most beautiful body of ours would perhaps be as much inferior to the most beautiful Greek one as Iphicles was to his brother Heracles. So the divine brother and the mortal brother. And this difference between the mortal present and the immortal past, this is the sort of model that Kubertin is reflecting. And again, uh, or sorry, that Winkelmann is reflecting. And Winkelmann invokes this again specifically with the notion of the Olympics. So we have this sort of ide idealization of the Olympics even in Winkelmann's era. He says the Grand Games were always very strong incentive for every <coughs> Greek youth to exercise himself as Pindar tells us, to be like God, like Diagoras, was the fondest wish of every youth. And again, I just want to pause for a second on this statement, to be like God, like Diagoras. We have multiple levels of uh, imitation here. Diagoras himself is like the gods, and athletes then want to be like Diagoras, who is like the gods. We have imitation on imitation on imitation, these sort of stacks of mimetic representation happening. Now, uh, with this idea, of course, there's this notion of exercise itself as one hand, on the one hand, the, it is exercise that produces these beautiful bodies. And this is what Winkelmann insists on. He says, these exercise gave the bodies of the Greeks the strong and manly contour and many contours, which the masters then imparted to their statues without any exaggeration or excess. So this is an interesting statement, without exaggeration or excess. We saw that in the Cleombatros inscription, right? This idea of the, of the statue itself being an exact reproduction of the athlete. And this perhaps also goes to uh, a small piece of evidence. This must be what Winkelmann has in mind, uh, is this reference in Lucian to a rule that 
argues that statues cannot be larger than life size. Uh, it says, the stewards see to it that no one transgresses this rule, examining the statues even more scrupulous than they did competitors' qualifications. So you can imagine them out there with their tape measures making sure that these statues are of the exact size. But of course, here we have this conflict. We have the Cleombre Charles inscription on the one hand, and we have Polyclitus on the other. We have the exact image and representation or replacement of the athlete, and then the understanding that Greek sculpture is somehow goes beyond what is real. So Winkelmann tries to solve this through the notion that within the history of Greek art, there is the development of this notion of the idea. And he says these frequent opportunities to observe nature pr prompted Greek artists to go further still. They began to form certain general ideas of the beauty of individual parts of the body, as well as of the whole, ideas which were to rise above nature itself. Their model was an ideal nature originating in the mind alone. So again, a very interesting idea, this idea of going beyond reality. But if we compare this, say, to what Vernon had said, this notion is not in reference to the gods. This is in reference to the, to the idea of the monarch. So there's an, a notion of the sublime here that Winkelmann is attempting to get access to. So essentially what we have in Winkelmann is a mimetic paradox. The Greeks are both an ideal to be imitated, and at the same time, this Greek ideal is something which is not based on <coughs> imitation. Now we see this also in other, uh, in also other aspects of the German uh, Bildungsideal, uh, specifically with Wilhelm von Humboldt, who's very responsible for other aspects of the German education system that was highly Hellenized and also perhaps influences our own. But he said the value which the Greeks placed on a free developed body, Ausgebildeten, stands out for all nations. And he said life can be considered like an art, and that in life characters can be considered like a work of art. So there's this idea, again, of the reversal, that the physical body becomes an object of art in and of itself. So if this is a notion or a tradition of bodybuilding, we do see, in fact, that this, on one level, does, in fact, develop into that uh, subculture we know today as bodybuilding. And this happens, uh, again, around the turn of the 20th century with the figure uh, Eugene Sandow. Sandow is a very interesting person, a strongman, a performer, but there's supposed to be a sort of historical moment uh, which, uh, of what were called muscle display performances, that where it is that the, the physical body itself became the object, not just in terms of intellectual traditions, but in terms of physical display. And here Kenneth Dutton in his work, The Perfectible Body, says, Sandow's posing introduced a revolutionary concept, that of the live display of the male body in the public arena as an object to be admired solely by virtue of its advanced muscular development. So not in relation to an athletic competition, but the body in and of itself as an aesthetic object. And of course, the Hellenizing tradition on this is most famous because we find Sandow directly in the poses of sculpt classical sculptures like the famous Farnese sculpture from the Baths of Caracalla, based on uh, the Hellenistic sculptor Lysippus. And so again, this example of sort of mimetic reversal really does come into an absolute representation with Sandow, right? The idea of the impossible ideal actually being made manifest. And of course, bodybuilding itself probably wouldn't have been possible without media technology, specifically the photograph, and the idea of being able to capture the still image and this reproduction of the image itself. So, and with this, what's fascinating again too, is that there's a discourse around this. This isn't simply a sort of a circus trick as it were, but Sandow, or at least those writing on behalf of Sandow, seem to understand this idea of a nostalgia for the Greek past that is really very uh, commensurate with Winkelmann's own writings. This is uh, from a training manual, Sandow on physical training, so you too can have a Greek body. Uh, he says, my notion about the ancients, and remember their wrestling is just as we have it in all results, is that they were not a bit better men than there are now living, but occasionally they found a man incomparably better than his fellows. The classical statues are all idealized. The complete dream of the artist who found an individual some perfect parts and shaped a form in which no ingenuity could pick a flaw. Of course, that a Hercules or Venus may have been is not impossible in beauty or strength. Nothing is impossible but we don't see such men and women everywhere. This is a very interesting and kind of contradictory statement. On the one hand, he says, Greek ancient bodies are just like ours, and that the beauty itself of statues is idealized. And yet, you know, this impossible idea, ideal beauty, perhaps it could be found somewhere. And of course, on one level, this is a very uh, 
immodest statement because what he's saying was, well, you found it right here, baby, right? <laughs> In the figure of Sandow. But this idea of Sandow as the idea of the representation of an impossible. But at the same time, what I think is important is the articulation of a paradox, right? A paradox that is allowed to exist as a paradox, right? That he contradicts himself. All the statues are ideal, are idealized, the complete dream of the artist. But uh, as far as beauty and strength, nothing is impossible. So this, this contradiction is inherent there. Now consequently, uh, the Farnese itself has become a major source of influence even in the history of modern bodybuilding. It was in fact the Farnese Heracles that inspired Joe Weider, the coach to Arnold Schwarzenegger, to pursue bodybuilding. Uh, and it was his, his viewing of the Farnese that inspired this. He said, seeing the Farnese Hercules was a revelation, a turning point in my life. It became the ideal I held in my head of what a bodybuilder should look like, and I don't know of any other piece of, of art that personifies power so effectively. There's just something magical in the Farnese that speaks to the sort of man like me who's always wanted to be bigger and stronger. It's kind of simple, really. What he has is what we want. So again, this is a very fascinating statement. I think it's perhaps more philosophically profound than Joe Weider actually understands. What he's giving expression to is this idea of an eternal desire, right? What he has is what we want. What the statue represents, in some sense, is desire itself, right? And this whole tradition of bodybuilding is based on that desire, right? And consequently, of course, it's no mistake that Arnold Schwarzenegger's first movie was Hercules in New York. Uh, if you haven't see, seen it, I wouldn't recommend it, but <laughs> in any case, if we look to this then, what we find at the turn of the 20th century is this convergence of this history of what we could call bodybuilding beginning in the 1700s uh, with, on the one hand, bodybuilding itself, the static posture in imitation of a sculpture. And on the other hand, we have the idea of the, of the sculpture turning into a living sculpture, an athlete, in the case of the athletic movement. So really, I think uh, the 20th century becomes this turning point uh, for this idea of using Greek <coughs> sculpture, a return to the Greeks, to promote this notion of a type of impossible idea. <coughs> but of course, on the other hand, we have seen the ways in which this notion of the impossible ideal can also be used for political purposes, as in the case of Riefenstahl's movie. Now, what's important here to think about is on the one hand, this looks like a very modern construct. Uh, this notion, it requires a sort of idealization of the Greek past, right, to understand this notion of mimetic reversal of human bodies today in imitation of ancient Greek sculptures. But the fact remains that this discourse on what we could call bodybuilding, it actually exists also in antiquity. And this is, again, something I think that is really striking and surprising. And here I want to return specifically to the work of Galen, our, uh, our best source for polyclite symmetry. Of all of our different literary analyses and references to, uh, to polyclitus, Galen is the most prolific, and it's very interesting for why it is that he describes this, and I'm gonna sort of talk about the motivation for why Galen, above all others, is going to be talking about the impossible ideal of sculpture. He says, uh, for having taught us all things in his writing on the symmetry of the body, Polyclitus confirmed his account in action through the creation of a statue, which he also called the canon. He says, the beauty of the body then exists in the symmetry of the parts according to all doctors and philosophers, and health of the elements is symmetry of between them. So on the one hand, Galen is actually working with humoral theory and this notion that the balance of the body is a balance of humors on the inside, and that the balance of the parts of the body is a reflection of health in the external circumstances. So there's an analogy of health as balance, something that we again have today also with Stoic philosophy uh, and other aspects, this idea of health and moderation. And again, what's interesting about this though is what we ultimately have is an inversion of this specifically with the notion of polyclitus in, represent, in reference to the concept of nature. So again, this idea of the divine image and the sort of production of it. What is the source of the divine image? Here, uh, Galen actually criticizes those uh, talking about polyclitus. He says, here's something to wonder at in those men who say that nature has no skill, no technique, no form of uh, expert knowledge. He says, namely, that they praise sculptors for making the parts on the right side precisely like those on the left, but fail to praise nature, who in addition to making the parts equal, also supplies them with actions and more than that, with usefulness that is taught to the animal right at, 
at the beginning, as soon as it was born? Or is it right to admire Polyclitus for the symmetry of the parts in his statues called the canon, and yet necessary to deprive nature not only of praise, but of all <laughs> skill? Nature who exhibits the symmetry of the parts on the outside, as sculptors do, and also deep below the surface? Or is not Polyclitus himself, who was the imitator, at least in what he was able to imitate? So if we think here, what we have ultimately is in fact an inversion of the traditional reception of Polyclitus. Polyclitus understood as being going beyond nature. And for Galen, Polyclitus is the sort of supreme and prescriptive representation of nature. And again, th what's important for the understanding of his understanding of nature specifically uh, as a craftsman. And here, uh, let me see if I can find it. He says, uh, to deprive nature not only nature who exhibits the symmetry of the parts as a sculptor's. So the, the action of nature is uh, what's called demi orgo, and this idea of the demiurge that we have, which really means craftsman. And so we under Galen understands Polyclitus specifically uh, as a representation, as a demonstration of nature as craftsman. So this idea of imitation <coughs> then is applied to the divine level, that nature itself becomes the source of creation, and nature as an actual craftsman. So on the one hand, we have that reversal, and with this, then, what we have is a very interesting account, because if nature is, in fact, the divine craftsman, then what does this mean? That means that all humans are, in fact, sculptures. And, the, and then with this, Galen also insists that, uh, you know, perhaps not everybody can imitate polyclite sculpture, but some can. There are certain bodies. Uh, and he says this in, a, in, a, in this quote here from the text De Sanitate Tuenda on the Preservation of Health. He says, nobody can grow up well-constituted or perfect in appearance in the immoderately extreme climates, as recent teaches and experience proves. But the best body about which we are now speaking is like the canon of Polyclitus, and many sil similar bodies are seen in our land, which also has a temperate climate. But among the Celts, Scythians, Egyptians, Arabians, one would never dream of seeing such a body. So this is a very disturbing statement, a, a statement really of sort of racial ideology, that certain bodies are specific to certain climates, and that the most perfect ones appear in certain geographic and climate locations. And so what's fascinating is what we do have in Galen is in fact another form, an ancient form of body fascism, right? And what's fascinating too, within this text, he goes on to say that the climate of Italy specifically is very similar to that of Greece, and he says, but he refers to Greece as the fatherland of Hippocrates. So there's this interesting discourse here in which we see well, not just this argument on a relationship between environment and physical bodies, a sort of geographic and national location, but we also see this connection in terms of the relationship with authority. That Galen will refer to Hippocrates as a source for authority, and at the same time, Polyclitus becomes a source of imitation as an idea of that authority. Why would Galen want to do this? Well, what we see ultimately then is the authority of the doctor. The doctor whose gaze, whose, whose vision in looking and analyzing a patient can think about the balance of the body, and he brings the Greek tradition to bear on that body, to Hellenize the body, as it were. So again, a very disturbing example of what we could see as a form of ancient body fascism within specifically medical texts. But it's not just medicine alone in which we see this sort of imitative reversal, this notion of body building. There's another very important but obscure text uh, one very dear to my heart, from the uh, Roman imperial period, Philostratus' Gymnasticus. This is a text written by the sophist, uh, Philostratus, responsible for other works, Lives of the Sophists, Life of Apollonius Tiana, uh, Imaginus Heroicus, written sometime during the third century CE. It's actually our only complete text on ancient athletics. Again, this is one of the most frustrating aspects of the study of athletics, is we have these representations, we have uh, you know, archeological finds, <laughs> but we have very little written directly about athletics. We do know, in fact, that there were multiple training manuals known as Hupam Nemata in the ancient world, but none of these exist and we only have references to them. Now, Philostratus himself, though, is not an athletic coach. And so this isn't a training manual per se, but it's really a question about the knowledge of athletic training and its position within a broader question of Greek education within the Roman imperial period. And more, more importantly, he actually points specifically to the unique role of the coach as a sort of purveyor of Hellenism in the Roman Empire. Now within this text, it's very, uh, he actually gives a similar account of symmetria for the, how the coach approaches the athlete. 
So the, according to Galen, the doctor approaches his patient with a view to ancient sculpture, and the coach will also do the same. Uh, in talking about how the coach should view the athlete, he says, the nature of the parts of the body is to be observed in the following manner as in sculpture, that the ankle corresponds with the wrist, the form with the shin, the arm matches with the thigh, and the buttocks with the shoulder, the back be seen in relation to the stomach, and that the chest project similar to the area below the hip, and the head the, as the benchmark of the whole be proportional to all of these. And again, the key term there is symmetria. So we have a very similar principle of symmetria here, but again, a context of reversal where uh, uh, Philostratus is proposing that the coach look at the athlete according to the art historical principles of, uh, of symmetry. And consequently, uh, I think also uh, Philostratus provides a detail into a long debate in art history. The so-called hypertrophic iliac furrow here, known as the belt of Adonis or sex lines in men's health magazines, uh, <laughs> there's this question that this, in fact, the extreme hypertrophy there is one of the prime examples of hyperreality or irreality that nobody's iliac furrow is actually hypertrophy to that extent because it's a ligament, not a muscle. But according to Philostratus, he says that the chest projects similar to the area below the hip, so that we see a sort of balance, an artistic balance that can explain this strange departure from reality. But again, what's important is the fact that we're applying an art historical model to physical bodies. This itself seems ridiculous, and of course, uh, scholars have said, well, perhaps this is a, a demonstration that Philostratus himself does not have any common practice in athletics. But this is not the only place in which he does this uh, comparison. He also talks about the wrestler's body uh, and the, the ideal wrestler's body. And here he says, it, again, a sort of semi-contradictory statement. He says the proper wrestler is tall rather than proportional, but let him be put together like the well-proportioned, neither long-necked nor with a neck yoked to his shoulders. For the latter is suitable, but for one familiar with the statues of Heracles, it is nearer to the one punished rather than trained. How much more pleasing and godlike are those statues that are free and not with short necks? So again, an interesting statement. Somebody with a short neck would obviously be good at wrestling because it prevents holds. And yet, that is not the one that we should prefer. We should prefer the one that is balanced. Why? Because the other one looks like it is punished. Now, the uh, German classicist Julius Jutner from his 1909 commentary said that the punished Heracles must be the Farnese from the Baths of Caracalla. And Philostratus is writing at the time of Caracalla, he's said to be a part of the circle of Julia Domna. So it's very well the case that this could in fact be the punished Heracles. And of course, mythically, this is the punished Heracles because this is the mythic event of the Apples of Hesperides, one of the last of Heracles' labors. So there's a way in which he's mythically punished. And at the same time, there's a sort of semiotics involved this overly muscularized figure, the, the Farnese, the sort of extreme hypertrophy, could signify slavery and manual labor. And what Philostratus argues for instead is this idea of the, the trained Heracles. Now, at the Baths of Caracalla, we do have another sculpture some have attributed to Polycleitus uh, a sort of Polycleitan Heracles. So there, perhaps then, Philostratus is actually talking about imitating one type of sculpture and not another, it do two different versions of Heracles. This itself is rather incredible, though, because uh, it sort of indicates a sort of aesthetic preference and not just one example of imitation as opposed to others. Now, Zara Nubi, in her work, uh, Greek Athletics in the Roman World, has suggested that the placement of the Farnese and its twin, there would have been two, in the Frigidarium at the, uh, at the Baths of Caracalla would sort of act as a mimetic paradigm, as a model of imitation. Uh, there would have been mosaics of historical athletes, and as you know, the athletes would cool down at the baths. Uh, Newby says, while the mosaics and the palaestra suggest that the bathers could see themselves in these figures of athletic prowess, Heracles too acts as an athletic role model, the brawniest and burliest of them all. And of course, we've seen this with Joe Weider, seeing the same desire for imitation, and we see it yet again with Eugene Sandow. So, so in one way, the baths of Caracalla really are sort of one of these ancient sources for this notion of imitating ancient sculpture that would persist throughout history. But of course, what's so fascinating is Philostratus' own claim, right? How much more pleasing and godlike are those statues that are free and not with short necks? So what, he, what Philostratus is suggesting then is not just any blanket imitation of sculpture, but a sort of uh, a distinction that's involved. That is to say, uh, Philostratus is arguing for classical symmetry as opposed to Hellenistic hypertrophy. 
Now, of course, why would Philostratus himself want to invoke this? And on the one hand, we saw the motivations from Galen as a justification for nature. But Philostratus has another model in mind, which is a sort of revivification re of ancient athletics. The gymnasticus begins with what we can see as a sort of generational decline in ancient athletic practice leading up to the present. So a disparaging of the present in relation to the past. He says the old athletic training used to make Milo's and Hypostenes uh, and Polydamuses and Promixes and Glaucus. So these are all athletic heroes. And also athletes before them, Peleus and Theseus and Heracles himself. And athletic training in the time of our th fathers knew lesser men, but still amazing and worthy of recollection. But the th training that has been established now has been harmed, uh, has harmed the affairs of athletes so much that many are burdened by those who take delight in athletics. So there's this way in which we see a generational decline, according to philosophers, a sort of temporal history of athletic practice where Heracles and these Greek heroes are the ideal model. So in, in some sense, we can see a, a direct motivation for why it is that we'd want to imitate the ancients, or at least according to philosophers, is to re-embody the, the ancient Greek past. But again, what I think is important here is to situate both Philostratus' text vis-a-vis -vis Galen, who has a very different account of the same idea of imitating the body, and then vis-a-vis -vis the history of the modern desire to imitate the ancient Greek body. So with all of these things in mind, I think we could really think about this idea of uh, the ancient Greek athlete in relationship, or the representation of it in relationship to modernity, as a notion of what we might call post-Hellenic nostalgia. Now, Jean Baudrillard talked about this notion of nostalgia specifically as a modern condition. He said, when the real is no longer what it used to be, nostalgia assumes its full meaning. There is a proliferation of myths of origin and signs of reality of secondhand truth, objectivity, and authenticity. Now, Baudrillard, though, is talking about our own postmodern condition and the proliferation of images today. And he posits a past that was, in fact, real that we've lost access to. And as a function of losing access to that, there is a desire for it. This, this is when nostalgia assumes its full meaning. But what I've tried to show is that perhaps this proliferation of images is not simply a function of the postmodern era, but is in fact pervasive throughout history. And of course, nowhere is that more clear than with the sort of ancient Greek tradition of the body. Now, Nietzsche had also said a similar statement in this effort to realize and idealize and embody the past. He said, today we are again getting closer to all those fundamental modes of it interpreting the world which the Greek spirit devised. Day by day we are becoming more Greek. One day or so we hope we will become more Greek in our bodies. Now, the problem here, of course, and what I've tried to show, is that there is no Greek body, per se. There is only the representation of the body. And if we ever get back to it, if we try to access that real, that real is always in some sense deferred. And so there's, there's no way in which we can actually get access to this full realization, but all we have is that desire for realization, this desire to re-embody the past, which is always projected and never necessarily existed. Now, if we contrast this again with what Coubertin had said, talking about his promotion of Hellenism, in an essay titled The Philhellene's Duty, he famously said, from now on, let us let Hellenism do as it pleases, right? And sort of Part of the point of this talk is to show that Hellenism itself has never done as it pleases. Hellenism itself has been appealed to, in some sense, as a transcendental sign, referring either to beauty, nature, the gods, but always projected to the past and never necessarily realizable. And of course, nowhere is that notion of Hellenism more particularly uh, manifest than in the body itself. And sort of, we can sort of see this progression, and what I've done so far in the talk or uh, in this talk is sort of giving you a back and forth, but we could also present this in a sort of historical model. I resisted the sort of historical argument because I don't want a teleology. There's a continuing going back and forth ever present, and there isn't necessarily a linear history. But what we see in from our earliest sculpture is this idea of the lack of a reference in the case of the Manticlos. You know, who is this image? Is it Apollo? Is it Manticlos? What does it actually represent? Uh, all the way up to, of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Hercules in New York. But most famously, I think there's this other issue, uh, specifically this ESPN uh, series that always comes out with the famous title, The Bodies We Want, which again, perfectly captures the sentiment of what I think as a sort of idea of imitating the possible or a post-Hellenic nostalgia. So he says, uh, 
And again, there's a sort of blurb for this, and I wanted to read this to you because I think it's very important. He says, the bodies, uh, it says, why are we fascinated with athletes' bodies? Because we long to inhabit them, to inhabit them, to leap and kick and throw like a god. Because the greatest athletes in the world have ignored their breaking points and pushed their physiques past extremes. And because of that, because of them, the potential of the human form seems limitless. Now, of course, I mean, this should have been John Carver not writing these lines. I didn't know he was working for ESPN, <laughs> right? But there's this fundamental discourse, a similar discourse that the writers of ESPN are, are either consciously or unconsciously picking up on. A history of, the de of a desire to sort of what we could call as imitating the impossible. This desire to push back to something that is or is not there. And so with this notion, I think what we see uh, is really a, um, I mean, it's this sort of desire for an eternal return to Hellenism. But in tracing this discourse, what I also wanted to point out is that this impossible ideal is also used in different historical contexts for different purposes. So in response to uh, Kubert Tan, who talked about the Phil Hellen's duty to let Hellenism do as it pleases, we could say it's the Hellenist duty to become aware of the historical discourse and uses of the Greek tradition today. Thank you so much. Um, I hope, uh, particularly the men in the audience, don't feel terribly inadequate after looking at uh, all that superb plush. Um, I do. I, I was a little remiss uh, in the beginning in not kind of thanking our co-sponsors, um, who have actually done the heavy lifting for most of this uh, multi-day uh, experience, and that's the classics department and the sports science department. So let me thank them for that, uh, and thank you, and uh, open the floor for questions. Um, if you have a question, ah, okay. Let me give you the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you to Why is the focus only on male bodies? Thank you, yeah. I mean, this is... Uh, I should have changed the title to the cult of the male body or the male athletic body. And I mean, this is a very important point and an important question is focused there. Uh, there are a number of reasons for this we could, we could give. I mean, on the one hand, there is the history of the Olympics themselves. I mean, it becomes a circular argument. Greek society was extremely patriarchal. It was, in fact, you know, the absolute manifestation of patriarchy and, of course, there uh, the questions of misogyny and this, you know, misogyny is a Greek term, the hatred of women that is also there. There's this uh, focus on the, the male body and this question of uh, why aren't female bodies represented in the same way. Um, it's a difficult question. I think, I don't know if there's necessarily an answer beyond the historical context of this favoring and this patriarchal society. But one of the questions I think that's related to this is how and when does the female body itself become an object of aesthetic appreciation? Uh, and we do see this in, uh, well, I mean, of course, it shows up uh, with uh, the Aphrodite of Knidos and different figures like that. Uh, and Dio Chrysostom talks about uh, an interesting way in which he laments the adoption of foreign values in idealizing female bodies and not just male bodies. So we could think about it also perhaps in the nature of the military and athletic context for these figures. So for instance, the Chrysos Koros, this idea of the participation in war, the association with death. But um, why is it that the female body is not there is, uh, again, I think it's this difficult historical question um, as to, and it becomes circular as to the nature of, of Greek society. A great comparison in opposition is with Indic culture. Right, where the female body is absolutely va uh, valued and represented. So it's, a, it's something that's uh, difficult to understand, but I think trying to figure out the historical point of the shift is something that needs to be addressed. So I, perhaps I didn't quite answer your question. Okay, okay. Well, that's, that's good. Uh -huh. My uh, question is uh, more point of curiosity, but none of the quotes that you used uh, alluded in any manner to the erotic aspect of a naked male body. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so, um, and again, that's something that's ever present, and this also relates to why the male body, uh, Greek society was homoerotic, and it was a, 
a constant aspect of it. Um, and to what extent then in the ancient world is that there, it is in some sense always there. Um, and there's this question of the relationship between those two, uh, I mean, so for instance, the athletic realm and the homoerotic realm. And to what extent do they overlap and how much is, is there versus not there? Um, as far as, yeah, you know, of course, Winkelmann is most famous uh, for his own homoeroticism and the effort to mask that. So there's a way in which uh, that is there. And there's also another side to this, though, I think, which is this notion of, uh, I guess, the notion of uh, death itself, right? And this idea of the beautiful death, the mortality. Is there an eroticism also in death? That also gets into this close connection between sex and death, and then we get into George Bataille and things. I'm going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow, actually. Um, but the eroticism is ever present. Uh, and I think it's also uh, never necessarily stated outright, uh, at least in athletic contests, except when we get into things like platonic dialogue and things of that nature. So um, why is it not here? I mean, because I was getting into this question of imitation. And when we get into the notion of imitation itself, we're thinking about subjects and not strictly objects. And when we get into erotic desire, this is this question of agent versus object, perhaps involved. <coughs> so it's something that is certainly there and is, is ever present. But its connection to athletics is both there and not there. And it, it becomes this question of its saliency at any given moment, I suppose. So thank you. Um, you discussed the post clinic nostalgia, uh, especially as it pertains to the body. Um, do you think this represents our tendency as humans, at least in small part, to defer reality and uh, focused on, focus on the past or the good old days, or um, I guess to not focus on the negative aspects of the past, um, just as it is embedded, I guess, as part of the human condition? Um, yeah, I mean, so this notion of the past, right, and this appeal to the past is, uh, is something that is in some level ever present. And I mean, I guess one of the questions for me is, I mean, is this eternal? I mean, and you mentioned this idea of not focusing on the negativity of the past and this idea of a deferral. We, an idealization, where can we locate that idealization? Are we going to locate it in the past? At least as far as uh, this discourse, I think there is a continuity in the discourse in Greek culture because even in our earliest Greek texts, I mean, in the Iliad, we have Nestor, the oldest of the Greeks, referring to the good old days, right? And in the Odyssey, uh, Odysseus says, I'm not going to compete against athletes of a prior time because they're better than I am. And this is our earliest piece of Greek literature. So even in our earliest literature, we have this reference to the past. I mean, there is this question with the value of technology and science. I mean, one of the questions is, do we still have that relationship to the past? On one level, we could say yes. Uh, on another level, perhaps not. I mean, there's sort of, uh, as opposed to Greek epic, talking about a past that previously existed, we have sci-fi in the future. So what role does the future play in modernity um, as the flip side to that is something I think could also be thought of. But yeah, I think it is perhaps something that's fundamental to, uh, to the history of this, of this discourse. Hey, thanks, Joe. Yeah, really appreciate the talk. Um, uh, I have a question that I think brings a number of these issues together, and and really it's just more asking you for a comment. You know, it's a place where deferral is constantly there, where the human body is is specifically styled in terms of statuary, but it's kind of the reversal, and that of course is the end of the symposium, where Socrates is described by his his madly in love lover Alcibiades as kind of an ugly dude, but with, oh my God, when you get that cloak open, look how beautiful all those statues are underneath, right? And, and so I wonder if you you, you would uh, comment a little bit about uh, this passage, because I think it would help. Can you, can you give me a little a little more on what you'd like in the comment? I mean, it's a difficult, it's a difficult <laughs> it passage. Is, it, uh, it, you know. it is, it is. Well, what, what, whatever you think is most salient is fine with me. Um, I mean, again, I think there's the same issue there, uh, this question of, desire, right? And I mean, the question of absence, which is a fundamental feature of this. And uh, Socrates, of course, is the famous inversion of that. Uh, and in so many ways, you know, it's ironic that both Socrates and Plato are used as this model of 
Hellenic civilization, but he's somewhat, I mean, the figure of Socrates is always in reaction to it. Uh, and so there is a way in which I think Socrates does represent that absence, but a negative absence of this notion of Talos Kagathos, of the beautiful and the ideal. Um, and I think that also really gets into this, I mean, thinking about this connection with Kalos Kagathos, the figure of Socrates, there's also the huge irony uh, with Plato himself, of course, if we think about uh, the clouds, right, the play that, uh, for those of you that are, don't know, the play that represents the death of Socrates, and there it's required, there's the call to return to the academy, the gymnasium, where there's the stronger argument, and you know, you can develop a great body, and all of these types of things, but it's the academy that becomes the philosophical, philosophical school of Plato. So there's this like interesting inversion and historical play between that that I think Plato is certainly working with, and um, but not strictly subscribing to. And I think that's the, the importance here is this play on the absence and that space in which different things can can be represented. So uh, I don't know if that gets to some of what you're hinting at. I mean, the figure of Socrates is so hugely complex that I think. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll have a chance. Yeah, I think that'd be great. <laughs> Well, thanks very much for coming to Lubbock as well. I, I really enjoyed the talk. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, this is a bit of a self-serving question, yeah. but I'm curious to know, I mean, you, you talked a lot about the, the body and this ambiguous representative mode that Greek statuary is involved in. So I was wondering if you think this exists in Greek literary texts that simply, for example, in, in Pindar's Abonations, they talk about praise of athletes and use their physical features as part of them. There's a lot of parts of, in Pinder's definitions to have, you know, beautiful athletes doing beautiful things, right. or perhaps the exception that proves the rule in Isthmian 4, I think, it's Melissa's of Thebes, who's a wrestler with a short neck, yeah. who's contemptible to look at, but he seems to have done well anyways. Right. Um, so I was trying to think as you were talking about how even when the body is not present, and even when we move beyond the physical arts, that the representation of the body can still be there and still, and it's nostalgia for the past in the way that Pindar puts his athletes back into myths and, and uses myths to um, praise them that is, is somehow related to the topics we've been discussing today. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, Pindar is hugely important and also hugely frustrating because, I mean, because of the complexity of his poetry. I think there's a way in which Pindar is also perhaps working against this tradition. Obviously, he famously states, I am not a sculptor. Right? And so his, his media, poetry, is understood in opposition to the staticness of, of sculpture and its, its ability to move and its ability to capture things. And perhaps it's sort of, and I would think maybe the historical depth there. I mean, one of the most frustrating things about Pindar from the perspective of a uh, historian of athletics is that he doesn't actually describe any athletic events. Um, and so the sort of idealization, I think there is this the idealization there and in reference to the gods, but it seems to be almost, I wouldn't say non-aesthetic, but at least not in the same figural <coughs> mode that we understand sculpture. Uh, of course, I mean, this is uh, uh, something to think more about, but just the sheer, you'd think there'd be more description of the athlete. There's a sort of divinity and the beauty of the athlete and understanding the, re the relationship to the divine moment but it seems almost a great, a much more focus on the temporal qualities there, I would say, rather than the figural, per se. Um, of course, I mean, I defer to you on this, and I hope you can talk more about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The figure uh, at the top, the third from the left, from the light background, what was that uh, figure again? The this is the uh, Piraeus Apollo. And so it's, it's a representation of God. Yeah, it's a representation of Apollo. Yeah. Yeah. Are you familiar with the Riachi bronzes? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I just wondered because when I first saw it, I thought it was one of them. Right, yeah. And they are, and they are actually warriors, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, not a god, of course. But uh, there's a good story behind them when they were discovered back in the early '70s, and of course um, <coughs> they were refinished and put on display in the, the museum in Radio Calabria. They had them fairly close to the aisle. Uh, and then eventually had to move them back out of arm's length because many of these, we talk about homoerotic, but not how about just erotic. Uh, many of the Italian women were coming by and they <laughs> will feel as a fertility thing. Right. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. quite impressive. I've seen them. Uh, yeah, and, and this, I mean, I'm glad you brought in this sort of haptic element, this aspect of touch that's always there. There's a great uh, image I didn't include. 
Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger <coughs> created his own bronze statue, and it's him reaching and touching his own statue, which is the sort of, you know, uh, then that's literal homoeroticism there, right? So, you know, it's like auto homoeroticism. But, uh, the, um, but this idea of the touch there is very interesting, and, and this notion of it that becomes a, a sort of a, an important aspect of understanding this idea of representation, perhaps the reality of it or not. And I know the Rianches created a huge story. There are numerous sort of uh, comments and ideas of the Riache coming to life and uh, doing various things. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, thank you for being my reference. Um, well, a lot of the pictures that you show them going up, it's like men trying to emulate these statues, like the ones with the Hercules and the discus thrower. Yeah. Um, and you also said at the beginning of the thing that different cultures through different times have viewed the body differently and in different ways. Uh, how has like the role of censorship of the censorship of the body been played out through this? Considering we look back at sculptures that were just completely open, and then we still try to emulate the open sculptures even in a censored society. Right. Yeah. I mean, this. I mean, uh, one of the best examples just here on the thing is you know the, the fig leaf of uh, Sandow, right? And this, of course, also gets to Don's point that he's not here about peeking under the cloak, uh, as it were. And uh, this question of censorship, um, it's ever present. I mean, of course, you know, what is the difference between the top row and the bottom row is all the genitals are famously covered up in various ways. And that's even the play uh, in this ESPN series, The Body We Want, is, you know, that, you know, every single movement is captured just right so you can't actually see anything. You know, a heart, an arm, a finger, I mean, whatever, you know. Uh, there's this sort of idea of perhaps censorship also, I mean, the aspect of censorship also clearly plays into the erotic aspects far more strongly than otherwise. And um, I mean, it would be interesting just to actually look at that. I haven't really delved into that question, but uh, how does censorship factor into this notion of imitation, I think, would be a uh, very important uh, question. So thank you. It's the, it's the one critical difference is the fact that we are simply not as comfortable with nudity as the age of it is. Uh, thanks for your talk. That was really fascinating. Um, something that I'm interested in that's kind of been swirling around in some of these questions is the relationship between pictures, images of the body, and poetry, or the perfect body versus Socrates, who doesn't have the perfect body. and. Um, I'm thinking specifically of oratory, which is a really embodied thing in the ancient world, and biographies of Demosthenes and Cicero's own autobiography. You know, my neck was long and thin. I couldn't talk the way that I, you know, I couldn't, I didn't have the force or the power. I had too much force, too much power. And it becomes, uh, one of the metaphors for it is uh, wrestling. And of course, military actions are the weapons of your words. And so I was just curious uh, if you have thoughts on kind of the, the ways in which this becomes a symbol, a metaphor for things that are maybe more cerebral. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's there is this fundamental connection, especially with rhetoric and performance. And going back to the history of the Greek gymnasium, where these things are sort of co-occurring, the idea of rhetoric, of philosophical exercises, and athletic exercise. Um, uh, there's, and this is happening both in the early periods. You know, Isocrates is a great example, talking about the different ways in which training. There's so the uh, Pido tribe, the athletic trainer, will train the, the, the person in their athletic moves, and the other person will train them, or the, the philosophical teacher will train them in uh, different rhetorical arguments. Uh, and there's a sort of interesting aspect there, which I think is also important, uh, something I'll talk about tomorrow, which is this concept of timing and the idea of performance there. So we have this, and perhaps it's also why Isocrates in that quote where he says, nobody can make their body like sculpture, the finish of that quote is, but they can imitate the stories of men and perform like them. So there's this idea of action and the ideas of rhetorical performance as action, which is another aspect, the non-static aspect of athletics. So um, I think that's very much there. And this is perhaps the primary motivation for philosophers talking about athletics, because it's a fundamental feature of Greek education more generally. Than the rest of it. So, thank you. So, um, especially in connection to your section where you spent a lot of time with Galen, yeah. um, 
and then moving on to even talking about some some aspects of like you know you brought up the bench and kind of having that, that ideal man in training we can kind of like fit that you know, image right and, everything. and how it, it at least by the time the renaissance it connects more to this idea of like man is almost like a microcosm of the cosmos itself and the well-orderedness of, of the human body is a reflection of the well-orderedness of the universe yeah. and so like is that notion anywhere embodied in, in that early Greek idea. Um, because I, I even think of like when, when gods come to be, like like Kipsia, for instance, like we don't really have a whole lot to talk about in terms of the body other than like uh, getting castrated. Like other than that, like we don't spend a ton of time necessarily talking about them. So like how does this maybe fit into this big broader idea of like a, the cosmos and, and is it, does it in any way reflect that same ideal that we need to see end up coming out in the Renaissance which is so influenced by this concept? Yeah, I think there is, I mean, that's a great question, thank you, because I think there's a real, um, there's a tension, and specifically when we see Galen, because Galen's arguments are very much a part of this idea of this relationship, and there's, you know, this idea of balance, right? The balance of the body, internal, external, and in relationship to the balance of climate, that there's a sort of, fluid, uh, you know, symmetry that exists in all of these different aspects. But Galen is also really pushing for this singular notion of the demiurge as this divine creator. And what's so fundamentally different from that compared to our early sources such as Hesiod is that, you know, the gods are not creator gods. They, they are born into the universe, right? They don't exist outside of it. And so um, that gets into this other aspect of Greek religion, which is polytheism. Uh, and this, uh, this notion of multiple gods in a universe, multiple gods with bodies, but multiple gods in you know, competition and in discussion with each other, it's the other aspect to Greek religion that perhaps there, that might be the real shift, is moving towards a sort of singular cause and explanation for things, the sort of idea of a universalism that creates these balances uh, throughout. I mean, there might be a shift uh, at some point. The question is when and how does that happen? Uh, perhaps it's located in philosophy, this desire for, you know, or even perhaps with the pre-Socratics, this idea to find a single explanation for one thing, as opposed to this polytheistic notion. So multiple bodies as opposed to the single ideal body. Uh, so, and, and with our earliest sources, we do have this idea of a proliferation of multiple bodies and not necessarily a single perfect one. So, so thank you. Yeah, that's an important thing to think about, though, is that uh, difference. We can do one more question, if there's a question out there. Has all this research made you want to do bodybuilding, like, on your own? <laughs> well, <laughs> like, just there to body all day? Start living it your own in a different way? Well, it's kind of a reverse of that, actually. And uh, specifically, the well, so personal background. I was a strength and conditioning coach at UCLA for four years. And I uh, coached a lot of Olympic athletes. I was also a competitive power lifter and actually desired, designed most of my training in opposition to bodybuilding because I wanted to be stronger and realized that this focus on the aesthetic object is in, in fact something entirely separate from the activity. Um, so in some sense I've been thinking about these things in opposition and in dialogue, so I will never wear a speedo in public. But, um, <laughs> uh, but this gets to an important point here, which is uh, I think a distinction and a conversion between the idea of the body as an aesthetic object and athletic performance. So with this idea of the bodies we want, we have a fetishization of the athlete's body. So here, uh, you know, the quarterback from the 49ers or somebody else, do they actually concern, are they, the quota is pushing their physiques to the absolute limit. That's really not their concern if you get behind the mindset of an athlete. They're not thinking about pushing their physiques. They're thinking about engaging in an athletic competition or pushing their performance. So there's a, an interesting way in which we can think about the perspective on this from uh, a spectator perspective as opposed to an actual athlete. And this is where you have, I think, this divergence between uh, these two, between the body as object on display in bodybuilding as opposed to the body in motion and performance. So this question of static versus movement, I think, is something that, uh, thank you. Yeah. Great talk. Thank you. It's a quick synopsis of tomorrow. Uh, Okay, you, you want to do that? Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. sure, I'll let, I'll let uh, Peter uh, give us some options. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So tomorrow we have a, a, a symposium of faculty research presentations in the Formby Room of the Southwest Collection, starting at 10 a.m. 
with Dr. Charles Stocking, uh, and running uh, from 10 to 11, and then from 1.30 to 3.30. And if you're interested in having that schedule, I have a bunch of flyers up here, so you can take them with you. Uh, and we have a total of five talks, ranging from how to kill an athlete beyond limited experience in ancient modern sport, and by other guest speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Polakoff, what was exceptional about the Olympics of ancient Greece to finish it off. So uh, a lot of other things to consider with sports, the body, religion, and Greek culture. Thanks so much.